Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, good evening, Fade to Black. It is, what is today, Wednesday, or is it Tuesday? Is it Tuesday or is it Wednesday? Hold on, I'll tell you right now. It's Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, and tonight's show is brought to you by accidental truth it is the new documentary out right now streaming on all platforms and directed by ron james the links for it are below go and check out accidental truth it is required viewing from everyone in our community accidental truth tonight on the show i'm very excited tonight gene broida is with us and she's with us for the first time uh, we're going to be talking about everything tonight we're going to jump all around she is a veteran investigative reporter and mscis has written hundreds of published articles on wide-ranging subjects from politics to health and finance and technology climate the paranormal and much more i've got her book on ufos here in the studio we'll be talking about that too as well and she is able to connect the dots and expose above top secret information, cover up suppressed sources, and arcane occult knowledge. That's what I'm talking about. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, the one and only Jean Brody. There she is right there. Jean, good evening, young lady. How you doing? Good evening, good evening, and howdy, howdy. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Mr to be here with you, Mr. Church. Yeah, I'd love it's, to be here too. But yeah, you know, we could switch fine. days for switch lives for a day yeah it, clearly i'm excited to be here it, it's Let about me just time. calm down yeah it's about time it's about time <sighs> and uh okay so let's actually start here uh you get the first time guest disclaimer okay so we can calm down with that gene it's just you and i sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends and where that conversation starts it starts where it ends it ends but we're gonna end as friends there you go you Aww. ready yeah. Aww, yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, here um I'm going to I'm going to start with the uh the typical question um but for you it's uh, it really applies. You've been at this for a very 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 long time. Um let's turn back uh the pages a little bit here and and I I'm, I just want to know where your interest started in the subjects that this community covers. UFOs, consciousness, Bigfoot, uh, historical places around the world, you know, lost history. Um, you write and 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 cover all of these topics. But but what happened? Was there a, a, a single event uh, years ago? There was. There was a single series of events. What I was a lonely, geeky child. So I turned to books. For comfort and solace, devoured books, devoured all the books at home, devoured all the books at the school library. And then through music lesson connections and a mother who taught at the local university campus got access to university libraries. And it was there that I discovered there were new shelves I'd never seen before at school, at my school, on the paranormal and so I started look, leafing through those, and that was really interesting. Ghosts, ESP. But the subject that really grabbed me, for, and I'll never know why. Actually, I think I do know why. We could talk about that later. But for some reason, and other people have felt this too, I, I gravitated toward the topic of UFOs. 
And I can state categorically that Eric Von Donegan shaped my opinions originally and to this day. I credit him with my lifelong interest in the topic. He, after all, came from a lay background, didn't have college degrees. Father was in the hotel business. He took it upon himself to start questioning history as taught in school. And he wrote, of course, now infamous Chariots of the Gods. The other author that sticks out in my mind is J. Allen Hynek, mm -hmm. Dr. J. Allen Hynek of Project Blue Book fame. He wrote Flying Saucer exposés. Lots of guys did back in the day and reputed scientific minds, military minds. My dad was a nuclear physicist. Well, I shouldn't say physicist, a nuclear technician, more mm -hmm. appropriately. And uh, he, was in, he worked as a contractor at the Pentagon for a year. So when I got involved in, the, in reading books by Von Donegan and Hynek, when I was about 14, 15 years old, I took these books, those two books in particular, one by Hynek and Chariots of the Gods, to my dad in the kitchen one day. I said, Dad, these guys, they're not just kooks. One's an astrophysicist, Dr. Hynek, and the other is well-researched. He's got, he paints a good scientific argument, let's just say. And I didn't know if my dad knew anything about the topic or not. I just said, do you think there's any possibility that the topic of UFOs or the phenomenon of UFOs is real? And because he was the smartest guy I knew, the most scientific guy I knew. And he thought about it. He took two, three beats and he looked me right in the eye and he said, right now, the U.S. government has no scientific evidence that supports the existence of ufos and now i'm thinking either he knew that was a lie and he'd been right, right, to say that right, right, he, was right. a, he was actually reverse engineering ufo technology and he found that question very problematical coming from a basically pre prepubescent daughter <laughs> terribly inquisitive you know or he was being honest and saying, no, I haven't run across this, basically. But the way he, he – just the fact that he took so long to choose his words, that long, it, it was – it seemed like a very long time. It wasn't really very long. But the whole thing seemed a little hinky to me. And now we know. Now we know that the period of time that I was talking about with him – so let's put this all in a temporal context. Bob sure. Donovan was publishing in the early 1970s, and I came along his books three, four years later. So mid-1970s, I'm asking my dad in the kitchen, and I'm talking about research that was going on from, say, after World War II, so the mid-1940s to the mid-1950s. That was a heyday of UFO research. And that's when my dad was involved with nuclear development. So that's why I was wondering if the if there even at the subconscious level at that age in the 70s, I knew there had to be a link between smart guy scientists, whatever they're working on, and UFO research. Because we know historically that smart guy scientists were asked when they had completed other obligations and projects within the military industrial complex, when they'd finished with those, if they were trusted, if they did good work, if they passed all the security checks and things like that, they they were taken to Area 51 or places like that to hangars with UFOs, shown UFOs and said, would you like to just like help me with his name, but uh, the guy who came forward first. Uh, who, Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar, the engineer who, who can draw from memory schematics of UFOs. He's done it so much. Yeah, and um, I, uh, the Eric Von Daniken um, thing, I thought that was my own unique story. My mom giving me his book in 1970 and and going to see, you know, Chariots of the Gods, the movie and, and things that that was my own unique thing. Now, a couple of thousand interviews later, right, <laughs> um, uh, I, I get that answer over and over again. And a couple of years ago, uh, Eric uh, asked me to be, one of his first guests on his new podcast. And I said, yeah, sure. Oh, that's an honor. And uh, so the first question, Gene, I'm not making this up either. He goes, so Jimmy, what got you into UFOs? I go, 
you, right? And and uh, and he kind of giggles, and and I said, but but Eric, I have asked that same question um, to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guests, and they all point to you. And I thought it was my own unique little thing where I planted a flag. And and it was my own little world. No, um, he has influenced so many. And I'm not so sure. He may kind of have an idea, Gene, but I'm, I'm not. I think he has no idea. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. To, to I be think he has no idea. And I'll tell you why. I paid some small na- amount of extra money to be in a more private workshop with him. So 40 people at mm-hmm. Contact in the Desert, where I met you, West, Contact in the de- Desert West, so in California. And this was before all the health emergency stuff. So people roamed freely. I thought, well, well meeting Eric Von Donegan, especially in close quarters, was on my bucket list as a UF a researcher and a fan of Eric Von Donegan. I was a fangirl at this event. I just went around getting selfies with everybody. And so my selfie with him is one of my prized possessions. And I wouldn't have it if I weren't the assertive person that I am. He was setting up for this workshop and he was speaking in German to his young assistant, who was the tech guy, I could tell. And Eric was struggling with some tech stuff. He's trying to get his slides queued up. And I'm thinking, this is my time to get my selfie. So I weasel my way. I just walked. I didn't weasel. I walked right up to him. He's sitting down at a desk. He's helpless. I walk up. I've got my camera ready and, it, and the focus ready. I said, I, I am one of your biggest fans. You got me into UFOs. And he's basically like, so what? <laughs> and I said something along the lines of smile, took the picture. And I'm so glad I did because after the workshop, I was shooed away naturally after the workshop. He had time for like six pictures with people before he just got too tired and off he went. Because And it wasn't too much. He, he didn't walk the earth plane for too much longer than that. And so it really was an honor. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, I have uh, one of my favorite pictures. I'm going to show to you here. Um, it, it's in my files as the selfie. You ready? I'm ready. I think we're all ready. Yeah. So there Oh, you- my gosh. Who so, isn't there? I'm yeah, blinded. Right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, oh, and um, I'm interviewing. This is live on the radio, uh, and it's, it, it's the <laughs> full picture. But it, during the commercial break, I'm like, man, I gotta take a selfie of this. Oh yeah. But the best part is is Eric. Look at Eric's face. I mean, you know, it doesn't get like, whatever, doesn't. whatever. Yeah, it doesn't oh, get any better. And because I had horned my way in and gotten my selfie, by the way, I, I was going to show you, but my camera's in the other room, so maybe after a break. But, uh, you know, to prove that I'm not lying. Uh, because, and also I'd sat, I was sitting in the front row. I mean, there were four rows of people, 10 in a row, basically. And I know, I've, I'm of, I'm this person. I'm the person he's talking to. I'm his audience. And I wasn't the only one who was an audience in the audience, but I'm very well schooled and I'm very articulate and I'm very mouthy. So when she got into the workshop, I'm following right along. And this was true with other people at the convention too, following along in conversation and asking intelligent, germane questions and making intelligent, germane comments at all the right times. Well, he was a bit combative and argumentative at first because I'd riled him by ruffling, by by upsetting his flow before the workshop. And I get it. I get that totally. As As a person who does presentations and performance, I totally get that. And I was in that sense disrespectful, but I don't have any regrets because that's what he gets paid to do. Okay. He's, he should know he's a celeb. And and he's so humble and modest. I will say. Yeah, that. he he. But he, uh, he knows he was he was com- he was confrontational at first in the workshop. But I won him over. I won him over because it's just you know my charm is irresistible for one thing. But when you get people who know the topics in the same confined space, the the in my opinion the enthusiasm becomes infect infectious. And he showed video that he had commissioned, where of of work he'd had commissioned inside the great pyramid in Egypt, going a, a little robot with a camera on it, going up a new passage, an unbefore unexplored passage, and up and up and up this ramp it goes and it meets a little wall. And so they bring the thing back and they reconnoiter and they get a little more funding and they put a basically a drill or a hammer on this thing and it goes in and it destroys the little wall so it can get through and it goes through and it goes through and it goes through and finally gets to a dead end and there's like a spike or something there's there's 
there was some hardware in there. Yeah, yeah. Inexplicable two. hardware in there and not much else. And yeah, two, it was two <laughs> copper plugs, two copper yeah. plugs. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah that was very inconclusive, weird. but uh, nonetheless fascinating if you like that sort of geeky thing, which I do. Now, what do you And clearly you do too. Yeah, I I, I studied that uh, for uh, it's called Gate and Brink's uh, door. It's uh, it's a fascinating part of the uh, the Giza pyramid. Well, we'll circle back to that. I do want to uh, talk about Egypt and and sites around the world, but I want to get your take on because you've been doing this uh, for so long. Uh, did you ever see a day where? Uh, we would not only have the Pentagon and Congress and Washington, but but universities and the community and the media all at the same time uh, presenting the subject of UFOs uh, to the world like we are today. Did you see this coming ever? Well, it was on my mind constantly and something I hope for. But what's most interesting to me is that despite all of that aforementioned by you, the general public doesn't know about any of that. In other words, after all those years of CIA funded discrediting and disparaging and ruining careers, Teasing. I had hoped for a public apology, quite honestly. Uh, and I know that's a little much to hope for, but I had hoped that some agency would come out and say, well, we weren't completely telling the truth. But instead, this new structure has grown up all of a sudden out of the Pentagon that uh, in order to defend their naval airmen, especially in other branches of government, personnel in other branches of government, they've decided to admit, yeah, these things exist and we don't know what they are. But that didn't make front, front page news, interestingly enough. That came out in, I think it was April or May of 2020. And there were other health issues going on in the country and the world at that time, as you may recall. So what better time, I guess, to leak the so-called Tic Tac videos? Or they didn't leak them. They declassified them. And then they said, yeah, these are, these are our property. They're government property. They're the real thing, in other words. So basically all the analysis that all the analysis and discussion that had come before that regarding those specific videos and any other like them, plus any other military or non-military sighting ever in history, comes back up for review. And it's kind of like the legalization of pot, where we spring people out of jail who were formerly criminalized because they're not criminals anymore. How about that big fat apology from the federal government for all the people who were reviled for covering UFOs in a very serious way? And now it's being covered in a very serious way. And still the average person doesn't know it's being covered in a very serious way. Yeah, that's my yeah. take on it. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really, 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 really good point. And um, there's, there's another part to that, though. Um, it seems, uh, at, at least from where I sit, uh, that the world is so much more educated now, right? It, it, much smarter. And when when Heineck and and Blue Book in the '40s and '50s and '60s and and that's Donald Kehoe and and James McDonald and and everybody else that was involved uh, with uh, UFOs and the investigation of them, um, we didn't have an understanding of like we do today of the universe and and planets and the size of things. Um, today, I think everybody knows universe is a very big place and it's got to be full of life and that's the other interesting part where i think the planet is handling things pretty well don't you respectfully i have to agree somewhat but disagree that first people know people generally know more about say astronomy or the nature of nature it's not at all clear to me that that is true, especially after decades of dumbing down. I've mm. seen videos, YouTube videos, and, and you can find the other spectrum of this as well. You can find plenty educated and smart youth who, who will be our sa saviors in the future. I have no, no worry about the decline of that, that aspect of the decline of civilization as we know it. However, there's plenty of reporters wandering around college campuses where basically students don't know where they live, cannot find the United States on a map. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking, so, so one thing is it's not at all clear to me that the, the average person is better educated about science generally than they were 
after World War II. And I say that because, remember, after World War II, there was this rise in, and spike in interest in science and technology. It went along with this recruiting of smart, smart people after World War II, people who demonstrated their cleverness both uh, mechanically as engineers, but also theoretically as well. And so very smart people were recruited and also came in from foreign countries through Project Paperclip, et cetera. So there were kids' books. I grew up with kids' books in the library about let's what would it be like to go to the moon? Go to the moon. And we had on TV soon after the Jetsons in the 60s. Before that, there were pulp, pulp comics and pulp dime novels and things like that about that, that grew out of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, there's been thought about science fact, science fiction, science fantasy for a very, 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 very long time. And the story that I'm thinking about is Betty Hill of Betty and Barney Hill, the famous abduction that I cover in my book, Unknown Objects, the top 10 US UFO cases available on Amazon. Betty, after being abducted and having had a rigorous medical exam, which was not at all pleasant, but not, but but somehow she she reported afterwards, years afterwards, that she came out of it smiling and feeling chatty and chatted up the captain of the ship who showed her a star map, basically, and said, Well, we live here. She said, Where are you, where do you live? And he said, Well, we live here. And he showed a star map. We live here, and this is our system, and we do this, we trade with these guys, and blah, 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 blah. And he said, So you've seen where we live. Now you know where you live relative to there, right? You could you could show me. And she's like, Oh no, I don't no, I don't know anything about astronomy or anything like that. I mean, I don't even think she knew the word astronomy, quite honestly. She she was a well a social worker, just wasn't her field. You know, I'm not degrading her intelligence. I'm sure she was plenty smart. She just hadn't learned that, right? But when you grow up with a dad who's a super scientist, you get introduced to books about space, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, th I think it really depends on who you hang out with. And I think you, Jimmy, hang out with people who know a lot about space. <laughs> no, that, that's true, though, <laughs> where um, uh, you would watch. I think Jay Leno did it uh, a, a lot, you know, the man on the street stuff and would go out and, and ask people, you know, basic questions about history and geography and, and whatever. And nobody knew the answers to some very basic questions and questions that you and I would go, Oh, come on. You know, who's on a $5 bill? Who's on the penny? Uh, who are, you know, these questions and you know, what, and that you're right about that. I, 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 I think I have to agree. I have and then to maybe agree. get a little deeper. Why is, why at one time was a penny called a red cent? Where does that term come from? Red cent. What's a red uh, cent? What it's kind of racist. Why? What about a? No, it's from the copper. It's from the uh, copper in the penny. Oh, I thought. Are you I talking thought, about an Indian head penny? You think? Yeah, the Indian, Indian head pennies. I thought it was from the oh. copper content. Well, it could be. You See, might I, be right. Ooh, because, wouldn't want to go there. Would yes, not want to yes. go there. That's what I said. I don't know. But if most I'll... people don't even know there was an Indian head penny. Well, what about okay? And then we have things like uh, the the UFO hearings. Uh, well, we had one UFO hearing and then one aero budget hearing. Uh, the second hearing uh, uh, wasn't uh, as UFO centric as uh, certainly the first one was. Did that, that you talk about the twenty twenty two national yeah. defense budget? Uh, the 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 hearing in the House of Representatives last year with Andre Carson uh, chairing um, that was we haven't had anything like that uh, since the 1960s. You know, it was True 50 that. years. Yeah, True yeah, that. yeah. Well, what's really interesting is that all of a sudden, since 2020, with you know, first came the Pentagon disclosure, and I've been talking about writing about preaching about disclosures. Everybody, everybody in UFO research has been talking about disclosure. When will it come? It's got to come. It will come. It will come next year. 1993 is the year of disclosure, et cetera, et cetera. And finally it did come, but it came with a whimper, not a bang. And the next year or two, the government rolls out new agencies and new acronyms. UFO becomes UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. I did a couple of shows just 
picking that term apart linguistically. What's the military reasoning behind this new brainwashing term, basically? This all has to do with public perception of things, which is ultimately a, a type of brainwashing. And so why has the term UFO fallen out of favor? I think it's to obfuscate and, and obscure the topic entirely. UAP, what's that? It's non-controversial. It's not a hot button at all. UFO, it's a hot button. Right. You must well, be crazy you know, to believe in UFOs. Yeah. Well, UFO and uh, UFO means one thing to anybody. Aliens, not of this earth. That's what UFO means. And yeah. And yeah. and UAP it means nothing could, to most people. Right. That could it, it certainly I don't think that people make a connection uh, to, uh, you know, little green men from Mars when they hear UAP. And I think that that was done with intention. And the other What's also interesting about that name change is that the word object has now changed to phenomenon. And if you think about it, the object would be the craft. But what's really interesting is what you just alluded to or just said, that the, the real interest is, in my opinion, is are the occupants, the people inside the craft. And when I talk about this, a lot of people who really aren't that into the topic don't really consider the ramifications of if you if you allow for the existence of the craft, you pretty much have to allow for the existence of somebody who built them and drives them around or flies them around. And, uh, how, and that gets a little scarier for a lot of people. Well, it does. It does for me too, because if we, if we back up a few decades, um, the, the original ideas and myself included was a, a, a craft, some metallic, thing spanning the universe with some little dude in there you know with you know flying this thing and and today uh i'm not so sure if that is that's the case with some of them yeah absolutely but i think it's, there are so many different types of civilizations out there that they could be getting here any number of ways and 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 uh they are seen any number of ways, whether it is uh, interdimensional, if it's through a portal, um, or if there is something else going on, or if the ship is even solid, you know, we don't even know that. Um, I think that the perception is is so wide these days, don't you? I do, I do, and I think you're entirely right. Why would there own if, if there were any extraterrestrial species? why wouldn't there be lots? You know, if there was a single one, why wouldn't there be lots of them? <laughs> and I'm not even talking about Drake's equation, which I think is part of the CIA mind, mind F. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know how censored we are here, but. Censored, we're censored, <laughs> but, but we got you, Gene, we got you. Yeah, you catch my drift, you catch my drift there. I do, I do. Um, the Drake equation, and here, uh, I was talking about this last week. Drake, Frank Drake, uh, when he originally wrote it out and, and spit out his first number, the number that he came up with was 10,000. Now, Ten let's explain for listeners who don't know, the Drake equation is a mathematical formula that basically says... There are so many what Star Trek would call M-class planets, so many potentially habitable planets as far as we can extrapolate or determine mathematically by projecting what we know based uh, into what we don't know, that, that the probability is so high, there must be extraterrestrial intelligent life beings elsewhere. Go ahead. And, and, and what would that number be? And when he wrote that uh, equation, which I think was necessary, and it's still valuable today, but when he wrote it, we hadn't discovered, we wouldn't discover uh, our first exoplanet for another 40 years. He wrote that in 1955. Well, we wouldn't discover it empirically, but I maintain that we have had, we nations of Earth, we people of Earth, have had contact with extraterrestrials since time immemorial. Sure. And that they have been contacting government agents and agencies in more recent history and making secret pacts and deals that are affecting societies today and not necessarily for our benefit. We, we may be seeing some benefits, but not necessarily for the overall benefit of 
human embitterment. And 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 so uh, and I agree with that. But here's here's the issue, though, is that the government is saying over and over again, whether it's Susan Goff at uh, the Pentagon or uh, any of press secretary, by the way, if you didn't know people, yes, yes, um, it, it is. Uh, we just don't know. We don't understand. We need to find out. We just don't know. Yeah, and, and the weird thing, I have to interject. The weird thing is that the government is acting like these brand new agencies since 2020, 2021, 2022 are starting tabla rasa, clean slate. That We know nothing about the phenomenon. What? What about all these decades of research? What about MUFON? What about all the other intelligence gathering agencies and evidence gathering agencies, uh, in, even NORAD? I mean, come on. You're not just starting from scratch, and they're acting like they're starting from scratch. What up with that, Jimmy? Yeah, well, if you go back, you brought up Jay Allen Hynek, right? And and his book, the 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 uh, forget the exact title, the report on Project Blue Book, that was written in 1977, and he was an angry man when he wrote that book. Yes, he was. He was very angry and He's fed up. Ski. He was. And when you go and read, that's 1977. And the way that he wrote about it uh, back then, his his anger, his bitterness towards the government and the Air Force in general, that they did not take any of it seriously. And, and if they were taking it seriously, he had to represent to the public that it was a nothing burger. And that they had to explain everything away. And he clearly said that that is not the case. The way that he wrote about it in 77 is fresh words today in 2023. The book could be published today and and be just as legible and readable. And same with Major Donald Kehoe. You mentioned earlier, a friend of mine, a neighbor of mine, was cleaning out his mother's house, found a copy, a rare copy of... Kehoe's flying saucers are real and gave it to me a year ago or so. It's amazing. This is this is for first source for UFO research for many people. Yeah, I have a, published I have, in the 50s with I this have. fresh research they were doing, and he was reviled by his own people, by the military. He was oh, it just makes me so mad. <laughs> and and so where are we though today is 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 disclosure um uh, around the corner is, is that where it's we happened are? it's it's here it it done did it and, and you wouldn't what, know it but it done did it well to what degree <laughs> though because um and the, the reason why i say that is there are so many millions of people that their version of disclosure is absolutely 100%. What they need is the president to step up to the podium and say, we're not alone and do that on live TV. Anything short of that, they don't want to hear you and I say, oh, no, we have we have disclosure. No, n- not to them. You know, so uh, uh, when do we when do you think that we will get to that point? So, so the rest of the world can go, okay, now we can talk about this. That's a very good question. And I don't know the answer. Will there, will Werner von Braun's prediction that the U S government will stage a final false flag attack or perception of an imminent attack by aliens to, as our, mo- as our last total mind F <laughs> <laughs> basically mm-hmm. after pitting us against the Ruskies in the cold war and uh, against various enemies in succession, the middle Eastern co- countries came next. There, there were, he made a series of predictions as recorded by multiple people uh, that the government had plans well ahead of time to keep people fearful and to keep that, Black ops funding going as well. I mean, think about one other thing I, I really like to think about is think of all the billions and now trillions of dollars that have been spent on black ops to cover up UFOs specifically. Think of all the agencies and agents 
how many people have I met in my life alone? I know, I just know we're government agents because of the way they debunked the phenomenon when I was talking positively about it in groups. How do I know MUFON was infiltrated by agencies and agents to debunk and um, tear apart from within, destroy from within yeah, the yeah. credibility, the effectiveness. I, I went to a, a Colorado MUFON meeting where the state director was present and I asked him, the director of the state Colorado MUFON, MUFON Mutual UFO Network, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, in charge of collecting reports of UFO sightings for decades. I said, what actually happens to this data? What is the point anymore of collecting this information? And this would have been in about 2014, okay? So about 10 years ago. What is the point of collecting more data? Surely we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that these things exist. There's plenty of observation, plenty of images, plenty of video, plenty of testimony, plenty of confirmation. Why are we still doing this? <laughs> What's the point? And where does this stuff go? And the director said, the data is collected and sent off to Washington, D.C., where scientists analyze it. Mm. And the, his whole tone was like, you couldn't understand it, you dip. And that made me so mad just his whole attitude. And that told me right there, this is a, f that anybody anymore, I, I hate to say it, I'm sorry to anybody who still believes in MUFON. And there are some chapters in MUFON that do great good. The, the one near where I live has great members who do great presentations, but I'm just saying to you, it's not the force that it once was. And the data is going into a black hole. It's like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where as an analogy, you know, instead of a physical warehouse, there's a data warehouse and this stuff is just being dumped into a data warehouse, never well, to be seen again. Yeah. Well, uh, NICAP went through that too, as well with, uh, you know, Donald Kehoe. Uh, and when NICAP was first formed, uh, by Townsend in the fifties, um, it was, it was the, the board, Right, the board was was all uh, U.S. Navy admirals and retired and current, and then later the CIA was sort of involved. But later, NICAP was man, that was a CIA front organization. By the time <laughs> things things wrapped up, and then you had the same thing happen uh, with uh, TTSA, where you know you have twelve to the Stars Academy. Oh, I knew that was a fraud from the get go. The well, promises they made. Well, the is it because and, and the, the guy the guy they picked a front De, DeLong? Tom yes. DeLong? Mm -hmm. Rock star or something? Yeah, yeah. It, it was a band called Blink so, 182. But the point yeah. being the point I'm not again, I'm not diminishing his talent as a performer. It just seemed strange that such a person would be after <laughs> amongst all the people in the world who actually research UFOs and have high credibility in the topic, why would this guy be the guy speaking about this? When he has top top shelf engineers on in this company and other people, and they're saying, we're going to show you the goods. We've got the goods, and we're going to open the kimono. We're going to show you the stuff. They never did, and I knew they never would. I knew they were just Putin in the wind. Well, but, but why is this the difficulty facing uh, not only the agencies but the White House and the Pentagon uh, uh, with disclosure that they they do know uh, an awful lot. And if they start to open this up any further, they're going to have to start uh, explaining themselves and certainly uh, at least back to Roswell. Yes. <laughs> but I think there's another layer that perhaps doesn't get explored very often. And it's creepy. That's why it doesn't get explored. Because I think the ultimate truth in reality that was first discussed after World War II by scholars looking into this new topic for Truman first and then Eisenhower, that the fact is that as far as my research leads me to believe or know, ETs have been living with humans since time immemorial, and they've been shaping us to some extent. 
they're basically non-interventive, but they did show up to stop nuclear or at least alter nuclear proliferation. So it doesn't tear shreds in the time-space continuum and alter other planets, galaxies, dimensions. But basically non-interference, prime directive. However, the reality seems to be that they live and work amongst us. And there's so much testimony on this at both the personal experiential level. I've had people come up to me at conferences and such after shows like this, contact me and say, this weird thing happened and I knew this person when I was in school and here's a story. I, I knew this girl when I was in school. She was very odd. She had a pale complexion. Her hair was weird. Her eyes were weird. She didn't go outside much and blah, 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 woof, woof, woof. And then ultimately there are circumstances that lead the person to believe that in fact, this person was not from this world, was an alien of some kind or a hybrid and had substantiating proof for it also, some some kind of documentation or proof, which I wouldn't have today. I, I personally would not have today, but they at the time would have to substantiate their claim. Okay, so not just pulled out of the air. Yes, some of these tales are pulled out of the air. Some of them are completely fabricated, completely untrue. But given the large quantity of anecdotes and reports and experiences, it's it's almost like Drake's equation for this statistic. Out of all of those reports, surely some of them are true. It's almost impossible to believe that none of them is true, unless the phenomenon really isn't true, unless there really aren't UFOs and there really aren't ETs. But it's pretty clear to me that our government acknowledged the existence of both a long time ago. And if our government believes it, I tend to believe it. So in fact, it's not even a matter of belief, because for me, belief implies religion or faith. And nothing wrong with that. I have beliefs. I have faiths. But and but I have faith in things. But for me, the UFO topic or phenomenon is science, ultimately science and metaphysics, physics and metaphysics. And I think our government has known this for quite a long time when they discovered craft could not be piloted. The craft they were trying to reverse engineer could not be piloted in some cases without a brain craft interface that the driver, the pilot had to interface with the craft biometrically, this is this kind of thinking that we are integrated with these other beings somehow. They're integral to our society behind the scenes. This is creepy to people. And yet, because I'm attuned to this thinking and that I allow easily to have aliens in the world, I, I, I guess you could say my sensors are open I'm receptive to the possibility that anyone I meet anywhere at any time might be an ET. And there have been times in my life I was convinced, yes, this person I'm talking to is definitely not completely human, maybe not at all human. Just chance passing sometimes. Uh, one in particular stands out in my mind. We started, this was at a camp out, lots of people there. I'm wandering along with a friend, a guy's playing a guitar in an open field, sitting on a log. Uh, turns out we both had spent time in Colorado. He starts singing John Denver's song and I'm harmonizing with him and we're, and he's making up filking lyrics about something we'd been talking about. And I'm following right along. I'm right in his head. I'm anticipating basically what he's about to say. And we're singing along. And after it was over, it was, we had not rehearsed or practiced, but it was a complicated rendition of a song that isn't easy to begin with and then walked away never to see each other again. But basically in parting, I said, you seem very familiar to me as if we'd met before. And he said, I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the, the knowledge of this, if, if this was mentioned in an official capacity, that, yeah, E.T., okay, yes, flying saucers are real, but uh, the, they are actually among us. Is that is that something that the world can handle, or is that a step too far too fast? Is that getting Well, it? absolutely can handle. Yes, yes, yes. And I'll tell you, I always like to say, I ask what if at this point. What if the CIA had spent those billions and trillions of dollars prepping people for the existence of UFOs, whether for positive, for neutral, or for negative. In other words, for the most part, they're benign, 
for the most part, they're positive. For the most part, they're negative. So watch out. You know, the CIA could have taken a much different position from the get go, but it didn't. The CIA was formed with the express purpose of using muscle force to stop conversation, reasonable and intelligent conversation about anything having to do with UFOs. And they killed people who didn't stop talking about it. I'm thinking about Forrestal, first mm -hmm. head of the Navy, who wouldn't stop talking about it. So they declared him mentally, uh, well, depressed. He had clinical depression. They put him in Mayo Clinic and then shoved him out a window, pretty mm -hmm. much. I mean, that's the story, I believe. It's not the official report, but you get him out of the way. And so many voices have been silenced over the year. What if those voices had been supported? What if they'd been encouraged? What if, been, what if all those people who were hooted down had been thrust forward as experts in their field, subject matter experts? What if the CIA had run campaigns and commercials about not, not as sugary necessarily as E.T., the movie, Phone Home, mm -hmm. that whole relationship, but maybe... Yeah, what can I say? What about painting the real picture of what's really going on? That would have been refreshing, you know? Yeah, the, and 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 if we forget about you know, 1980, 1970 to 2023, when we go back and look at the reports and the sightings uh, before 1950 of, of absolutely fantastical phenomenal sightings and speed and uh things that those weren't in the sky back then we didn't have that technology Explain correct yeah that's that. why i like to research that period yeah because so there's just no question that that what they were seeing or experiencing were genuine ufos not reverse engineered human ufos go ahead sorry yeah no but that's exactly the point because today we have way too much technology. It, it, it's just everywhere. And, and what about the medieval paintings? That's what where, I'm talking about. That's in fact, I, I saw some of these paintings in Europe. I had the great fortune to study abroad as a junior in college. And I had the great fortune to tour around. And and I, I've always liked museums and collections of books and things like that. Antiquities, if you will. And uh, sorry, what we were talking about. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the paintings. So I was looking at paintings without thinking about UFOs or anything. I'm just wandering along. And here's one of these ones that people talk about today. It's the one where a lot of these paintings were uh, had to be religious. So in the f and, and a lot of them are a central panel and then side panels. OK, so structurally. And I was into stained glass at the time, stained, architectural glass. So these kinds of so you have paintings kind of symbolic or representing in the shapes of stained glass windows where they have a curve at the top, they come to a curve at the top, and then there's side panels that also curve. So you get Madonna and child in the middle quite often. And then courtesans or whoever commissioned the painting, their family and friends hanging around the side panels or a nature scene or a hunting scene or some other thing going on that's a little less religious, a little more secular. Well, in one of these paintings, there's a guy in one of, in the background, basically, walking his dog. He's out with his dog. Both are looking up in the sky. The dog has a pointed snout that's making a triangle basically up toward this thing they're looking at and they're looking at what is can only be described as a hat shaped UFO and it, when scholars started analyzing these pictures when people were start saying what what is that thing in the sky in that painting the scholars saying well it's you know it's uh, an odd shaped bird it's uh, the planet Venus. <laughs> it's swamp gas. I mean, it's like they had read Heineck before Heineck made those proclamations to, uh, hundreds of years later. But they were just at a loss. They didn't know. Well, anybody who knows anything about UFOs is looking at that. And they're going, it's UFOs. And then there's another one where there's one ship in the central panel being chased by another ship. It'd be this way to you. One ship here and then behind it chasing it. The action's going this way. The ship are going this way. And the guy in front is looking around behind like, oh, shit. Oh, shoot, how close is he? <laughs> He's gaining on me. And people, scholars were saying, no, 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 it isn't what it obviously is. They were saying these are other things that are being misinterpreted.
Yeah, you know, well, and in Egyptian, in the Egyptian are, cave paintings, it was always stylized flowers. Those light bulbs that are plugged in, those huge light bulbs with filaments inside them, those are stylized flowers. Yeah, right. I've seen that. I, I've I've seen <laughs> that in person, and I can tell you what it's not. It's not a lotus flower. What about the Nuremberg woodcut? Right. And, and yeah, that's that, crazy. That's one of my favorite examples. That is a battle in the sky, which is what they were depicting. And it's and, cylinders and triangles and balls and it's explosions. Just a crazy assortment <laughs> of shapes. Yep. 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 Smoldering so, buildings. Yeah, yeah, explosions. Apparently, de debris fell to the ground, according to they, eyewitness accounts. What was in the sky back then in 1500? Just somebody. A, an aerial me. battle took place, according to eyewitnesses. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, you know, so somebody. In the 1500s, uh, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, 1500. Um, somebody just explained to me what they were seeing in the sky, and then we can move on. But until then. <laughs> Right, and and that was their version of the Polaroid. You know, they have to right. capture it and, yes. and and get this done, and and that was a woodcut, so it could get printed, right? And so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm I've always been fascinated with that. And so, the government to say today, well, we know nothing. No, I think that they know a whole lot. It's oh, just, they know tons. They know tons and tons and tons. And so, for you to ask, could the public accept? Yes. Public will accept anything if it's presented the right way. The public, unfortunately, the majority of the public don't question much. I'm sad. I'm sorry to say, I was raised to question authority, and I do. <laughs> right. But not right. everybody does, and a lot of people claim they don't have time or interest, and in fact, perhaps they don't. Who am I to say they don't? But. They what? don't take the interest that you and I do in these topics. So what th they believe what they're told, basically. Sure, sure. Why do you think um, there seems to be, well, it doesn't seem to be, this is the way it's been going, um, that we only want to hear from the military on this, you know, military pilots and the military take on this and, and so forth. When we have so much information and eyewitness and, and imagery and everything else from the citizens of this country, but uh, we're not hearing from them. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's the next phase of military industrial control over the entire topic of UFOs, now UAPs. But you've raised the excellent point of the disparagement, the current disparagement of the civilian scientist. That's the term they're using now, the civilian scientist. So that would be Eric Von Donegan one of the original civilian scientists, that would be you and me. We're civilian scientists. So is a scientist a person with a degree? Is, in other words, what constitutes a scientist? Avi Loeb, he's a Harvard scientist. Does that, an astronomer at Harvard, does that put him in, in the position of being a pundit for astronomy and aerial phenomenon? Apparently, the globalists think it does because he's his views are promoted all the time in in the mainstream media. Certain voices get heard, certain voices never get heard. Uh, Graham Hancock has just released his movie or documentary miniseries, and it's great. Of course, it's great because it's Graham Hancock. Why isn't he a household word <laughs> on the topic of UFOs and and the research of human origin, which is by the way my passion human origin and it was the study of human origin that led me to ufos yeah i'm the same way well I, it's all connected though gene yes it's all connected oh everything connected. is connected and everything goes back to ufos and human origin everything does to me which is why to me the revelation that et is among us they come to visit also we're a science experiment to them or a bunch of them that at one point i read there's hundreds of science experiments run by different alien societies here on earth they have different attitudes toward humans and different interests and the purposes of their experiments vary as you would expect okay so some are well disposed toward humans some really don't care one way or the other and the others hate us and just would see just as soon would see us dead or in their digestive systems right uh the idea that they live work exist amongst us for me is quite palatable because I have an affinity 
for my clan of star people and others that are friendlies with them. And I have an aversion to the clans or species that don't like humans because right now I'm in a human form and I came to help earth and human <clears throat> people. Right. So I think it would be very, be very easy to sway human opinion, mass opinion to think favorably of ET if that's the desired objective, but it's not clear to me that all ET are friendlies. In fact, it's clear they're not all friendlies. So how then does a government agency regulate thought about a phenomenon such as UFOs? Can the government regulate thought when we know from firsthand reports these intelligences, these beings, are entirely capable of communicating with humans when they want to? And they can also do what they want when they yeah. want to. Here, for those out there, Gene, that go, why would they come in uh, cattle mutilations? Why would they? Do, why would they abduct him? Uh, well, why would they? You know, Betty and Barney. Why would they, they do this to Travis Walton? Let me explain something. The first chance we got when we are interstellar and we're visiting other planets, we'll be doing the same thing. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Hey, check that out. That little creature. Grab it. Boom. On board. We do it now. Yeah. We do it now on Earth. We do it Field now. Field biology. On Earth. Field biologists. Yeah. They go out. Marine biology. They go out. They take samples. Grab zoos. fish. What about zoos? Yeah. Sea yeah. World. What about zoos? Yeah. What about Sea World? That's a perfect example. But we're okay with that. Right. Or and are we? Not everybody is. But no, what I'm saying is we're okay with but, but, using yes. that. It's but, an established cultural institution. Right, right, right. We, we can't use that as a comparison, Jimmy. What do you mean we can't? It's the exact same. We are taking moms away from their children. <laughs> right? We're literally abducting species. And, and when we go interstellar, we'll be doing it then too. So why... Why the big question of uh, would ET be doing this? Not all, but I would understand if they did. It, I, I'm not. I'm not at all opposed to it. It just makes sense. I think one of the most potent forces in the universe is, and in all existence, is curiosity. And I think a lot of what is going on on Earth right now and historically is driven by curiosity. What I think Earth is a big what if experimental experimental station what if what if we just alter the variables a little bit this way and i've read a couple of very interesting accounts of how earth was formed maybe even terraformed populated by alien species to achieve where we are today and how humans were originally engineered to be non-reproductive which meant that the species that bioengineered us and put us on Earth to cultivate us basically as a species had to come back periodically to replenish the stock because we're, we would die off. And then a decision was made. Basically, the client who ordered human beings on Earth said, we don't want to pay the contract anymore to maintain this species, so we don't care if they die off. But other species of ETs and intelligences in the universe has said, oh, no, no, we can't let the humans go. They're too precious. <laughs> so let's give them reproduction. Sure, and There sure. was a big debate about that. Oh, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. But they did. And so we got reproduction. And that may be behind the story of Adam and Eve, actually, although I have other ideas about that as well. But at some point in our history, we became capable of reproduction. And at that point, the ETs who had bioengineered us stopped coming to Earth. They didn't have to anymore. And that's when things, that was really the beginning of the population situation we face today, which is some people say we're overpopulated on Earth. Some people say we could sustain the population if we allocated resources differently. Elon Musk and some people are saying we are actually in a depopulation curve. And Musk has come out and said, I think in 10 or 20 years, we're going to face a population implosion, deflation, mm -hmm. that there will be so many old people and not enough young people to take care of them or sustain their economies. There will be a collapse, a, glo a global economic collapse. 
there will come a time. I, I'm going to make a prediction. Uh, 500 to 1,000 years f- from now, we will be uh, fully interstellar. And and we we know about the limitations of this planet. This is what we will be doing. We're going to be building ships full of DNA and life and sending them out. Send them in, and if the if the ship finds something that is habitable, ship's gonna blow a a, a seed, right, and and terraform and 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 get life going, so humanity can continue once we burn this thing to the ground. And well, that's more or less what Musk has said, has promised Earth, is that we. We will colonize Mars under his direction and, and the direction of SpaceX, the, the hardware of SpaceX. We will colonize Mars to preserve the human species should we mess up Earth to the point where it becomes no longer habitable. Well, if there's a population implosion coming, I don't see that that's an issue necessarily. And if we can't handle our own home planet, what makes us fit to go trash other planets? Just well, saying. Just it, saying. Is there doesn't seem to be a bit escapist to say, "Hey, we can't handle it on Earth. We can't manage it here. So let's go to Mars, just to make sure there's humans left over. Should things go horribly wrong on Earth, right? Or or really, make, really, make, make really, it a, make it a club med. You know, and I'm the, not saying and, don't go to Mars. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it'll be a club med for the rich and famous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, think about it. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Gene Broida, is with us. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023 as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip with live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous Indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. Also introducing our Disclosure Fest VR Starship Area with dozens of rides. You've got to check it out. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit Disclosure Fest. Fest.org. This is Jimmy Church, and I want to introduce you to Life Waves X39 Stem Cell Activation Patch, which has totally transformed my health, my sleep, brain, and my eyes. I no longer need reading glasses. X39 is a true breakthrough in regenerative science. Using light, X39's patented age reversal technology is clinically proven to signal the activation of younger stem cells, accelerating the body's natural healing process. X39 promotes restoration and rejuvenation, bringing the life-changing benefits that I've experienced. By naturally elevating a master signaling peptide in the body, X39 boosts vitality, health and wellness, and resets 4,000 genes to a younger, healthier state. It's one patch, once a day, and you can turn back time with X39. Just go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's works with an X. HealingWorksNow.com. Hey, everybody. It's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, 
TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there for Bid and Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. River Moon Coffee. It's right here. <sighs> Links are below, and I need all I can because Gene Broida is with us tonight on the show. And Gene, one of the uh, more uh, oh, you need to unmute yourself. That's uh, uh, you need. There you go. Um, the um, the human origins aspect of of us is something that has been completely covered up. Talk about a taboo topic, right? And if you're in academia, um, you're not allowed to explore or step outside of the box. Um, and there are so many examples uh, around this planet uh, that that show us things. But but why is this such a concern with the establishment, the man, uh, to keep this stuff hidden from us? Well, that's another great question. And again... It's not clear in my mind why, except power, power, money, control, globalism. These are short and short one word answers, but what else could it be? I mean, you know what I mean? Well, um, if we. <laughs> not very I, eloquent, but I, I, I think there is, I don't think it's very deep. I think they want. They want it, and they don't want us to have it. It being knowledge, technology, but but things like um, uh, that are getting discovered every day. And uh, one of the uh, subjects that I talk about a lot on the show is Gobekli Tepe, and and my sign off every night on Coast to Coast AM was always Gobekli Tepe. My sign off here is Gobekli Tepe. I put it in all of my commercials. And 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 uh, raising the awareness of it, because uh, Gobekli Tepe is an example of uh, academia for forever said everything started in Mesopotamia, everything started in Giza, three thousand BC. That's it. There's nothing else to see here. And then Gobekli Tepe comes along. It's seven thousand years older than Giza. Not 7,000 years old, 7,000 years older than Mesopotamia. And it wasn't supposed to exist. And certainly that rewrites history, but it's not headline news like it should be. And that's an example of uh, things that are going to be and continue to be discovered, right? I agree completely. We, we know that academic institutions are hand in glove with government agencies that control information dissemination. For example, the cover-up of giant human beings by the Smithsonian, notably. Okay, so we, we know this goes on, and we know it's been going on for a long, long, long time. Gobekli Tepe, so, Gobekli Tepe, so interesting. When I saw pictures of it, I got really excited. It stirred memories, and there were so some very notable features that arose immediately, including the fact that the whole site was backfilled with a, a small pebble that doesn't exist anywhere in this area. It was transported in somehow, and the site was intentionally buried with this non-native rock to hide it, basically, or, or 
smooth it over. And when they started uncovering these pillars, the 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 carving on them is not um, it's not the kind of relief where it's carved out. It's the kind of relief where you have to carve everything else away. So it's not bas relief. It's the other kind where it sticks up and out. So you've got creatures crawling around corners and hands wrapping around corners on these pillars, basically. And it requires a lot of artistic planning and execution skill to do that sort of work. And so the first thing I thought was not only are these things very ancient, but they're elaborate. They're very elaborate. They're highly symbolic. They're artistically refined, not primitive. This is not primitive art. And the first utterance out of the pundit's mouth was that it had to be a temple site. This is a temple site. And then my first thought was, this is a UFO landing site. And I looked at these the, the structures that have been likened unto tuning forks. It's a Basically, it's a pillar that comes up and tees out at the top, tees at the top. There was a an above ground mono, monorails, above ground train being built for light rail around Denver, Colorado and Aurora, Colorado when I was living there. And I'm telling you, I took pictures of those structural supports to hold up the very heavy train track that was going to be going over lawns and other roads you know, and along the highway for commuting. And it's the same structure. They poured it in concrete, but it is the same shape. It's a structural element. It, it's not a tuning fork. It's not a celestial tuning fork. It's a structural element that's designed to carry a great load. If it were a temple, it would have a roof. There's no roof here. This is not, this, this isn't designed for something to nestle down in or on top of somehow. And these were arranged in rings, okay? So either they are landing structures and or they may have been able to be activated through sound technologies, resonance technologies. Michael Tellinger of South Africa getting into resonance technologies, other people too, but his work is really fascinating. You have to have him on the show if you haven't already. I have, man. You know who I'm talking about? Oh, I do. He's been, he's yeah. been in my house. He's been in my yeah. house. So sure. that that site, that 14,000 year old site with elaborate stone carvings, it's just short of having hieroglyphics in it. I don't think there's anything that's interpreted as uh, uh, glyphic, you know, um, language representation. I don't think they found anything like that, have they? No. Not, it's pictorial. Not yet, but that, that uh, pillar 43, I think it's 43, that kind of looks like a zodiac. There's something celestial there, which I, 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 it doesn't feel earthy to me. It looks like the constellations are represented there. And if you're going back to 12,000 BC, um, which allegedly everything was hunter gatherers, right? How would they, how would they look to the heavens and represent a zodiac? which didn't happen until, what, Dendera in Egypt? You know, it's... Seven it's ridiculous. Years. It's unthinkable. All of it is unthinkable for primitive humans. There is no part of that site that makes any sense in the context of primitive human cultures and societies. But then, really, neither does Stonehenge. I don't buy the theory, personally, I don't buy the theory that the rocks at Stonehenge were rolled over logs hundreds of miles away from hundreds of miles away to build stone edge. I, I find that hard to swallow quite honestly. And I find it hard to believe that thousands and thousands of slave laborers built the pyramids. Honestly, I just don't think that's what had happened. I don't think that's how it happened. I think advanced technologies assisted, if not did it all and did it all fast, very fast. It was easy. Yeah. Was, I don't know how they did it. Um, when uh, the first of the putting the Great Pyramid aside, I have my own opinions on that. I've been there, I'll I've bet you do. It. Uh, but <laughs> but the first time when you go to Saqqara and you roll up on the bent pyramid, right, and it's sitting out there in the middle of the desert, and you walk up to that, it is so frigging big, you don't understand because it's sitting out there. 
And it looks like you can reach out and touch it. Then you start the walk, right? And it's like a mile. And you're not getting any closer. And by the time you get there and you're looking at this thing, no matter what, it was easy. And it's big. And by the time, you know, and, and the Red Pyramid is a mile behind you, right? You turn around and, and or two miles away. Uh, the Red Pyramid is sitting right there. Uh, allegedly built at the same time. So wait a minute. And and then, you know, a few months later, they start Giza, right? And they built three pyramids there. Um, and if you put 20,000 people, if you follow, you know, Orthodox academia, 20,000 people per pyramid uh, over 20 years, it's like everybody in Egypt, apparently, man, woman, and child, everybody was building pyramids, and that simply wasn't, it, no, no, no. If that, that were I, happening, don't you think there'd be lots and lots and lots and lots of Egyptian art showing people building pyramids? And there's none. There's none. There are no tools left over from building the pyramids. I, I, I people, find that. People, I, I, <laughs> people who say it had to have been humans because there's nothing but humans. I mean, that's a pretty weak argument, first of all, in my view, because I... I believe there are individuals who are not humans. So it's easy for me to believe that non-humans could build things like pyramids on earth. It's very easy for me to believe that or, or allow it as a theory. Okay. A working theory, but people who cannot allow for extraterrestrials for anything, but humans cannot go there. It has to be humans. There's nothing else it could be. And that's true with the site in Turkey it, and it, all it, the other it, sites, the sites in South America. There, there's one you bring up a good point. So let's swing this back uh, a second. Let's put the car in reverse. If you have two and a half million blocks uh, on the Giza plateau, forget about the other seventy-five pyramids in in Egypt. Let's just talk about Giza. So Khafre and Khufu, right? The two main pyramids, two and a half million blocks each. That's a lot of copper chisels, and I would think. Right? Copper is soft. <laughs> but there would be pits of copper chisels. Yeah. We would see millions oh, yeah. of them. And where are they? That's all. That's I'm, right. I'm, okay, I'm asking a, a very easy question. Somebody point those to me. There are archaeologists have unco have uncovered evidence near the pyramids of human habitation. They've found beer and bread. But it is not at all clear that these humans were involved in building pyramids because where are the tools? Where, where's any? There's a little bit of uh, graffiti at the pyramids. Maybe you saw some in your I, travels. Mm -hmm. But uh, graffiti is a very interesting cultural expression, right? And even in the graffiti, there's no uh, that I have seen, and I'm no expert on graffiti at the pyramids, but you would think that if this massive public works was going on generation after generation after generation with all these people and all these blocks and all this rigmarole, especially if it involved ropes and logs and whatever kinds of technologies modern engineers say would have to be involved, right? Mm -hmm. There'd be traces of it. There'd be stories. There'd be songs. There'd be pictures. There'd be, I mean, these people drew everything. Why are there no pictures of this? That's right. That's right. But they, they there's plenty of bread making recipes, right? We've and got beer that. making. Yeah, beer making, wine. We've got they that. We found uh, containers, you know, amphoras, uh, vases. We have, that. We have containers, that. and they scrape on the inside, and they they can do analysis to see what was inside there, and they know they drank beer, not wine, beer. They had beer. They were making beer. In other words, they were fermenting beer and they were making bread although that might have been unleavened come to think of it yeah so, but uh, you can live on beer and bread <laughs> again again we have lots of evidence of that okay so they could bake and they they were uh they were uh making beer lots of fish heads right but <laughs> yeah but where's everything else that's right that's right I, I, do you feel that i agree uh, do, <laughs> do you feel that um, in the future, that uh, people like Zachariah Sitchin uh, were on the right side of history, 
that 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 is closer to our reality of our human origins than the other part that we are taught in school. Yes, absolutely. And when I first read Zechariah Sitchin, it resonated so profoundly with me that I was surprised anyone would debunk him. But I immediately found debunkers of Sitchin saying, how does he claim to know ancient Sumerian? By the way, for those who don't know, Zechariah Sitchin was the first linguist. Well, he wasn't a linguist, the first, per, the first citizen scientist to say he had successfully translated Sumerian text when no one else had been able to do so. And he had decoded, among other things, the human creation myth or history, as I think of it, from Sumerian clay tablets, tablets, which, by the way, are almost all cylindrical and they get rolled out. I saw a whole bunch of these in museums in Europe and scholars at the time didn't know what they were, what to make of them. And somebody, I think, was playing around with one on Plato or something one day, and they noticed it left an imprint. And they went, whoa, if you roll it out, it makes a tableau. It's it's uh, like a cartoon. I mean, it, it. and they began to decipher those and they get, you know, compare. They rolled out cylinders and they began to compare the texts. And the, and the first ones they got were counting with numbers. Numbers are always easiest when you're deciphering codes. So numbers repeated often and easy to represent. So they found accounting records for livestock and grain. Those were the first Sumerian records. But then they stumbled across creation myth, which was that the Anunnaki, ETs, came from their home planet to get gold from Earth to save their planet's atmosphere, a certain kind of gold, monatomic. And they found plenty of gold in Africa. So they put spaceports in the north of Africa, the cradle of civilization, and they mined gold in the south of Africa where Michael Tellinger is and strewed artifacts all over the place there when giants roamed the earth. Interesting, interesting stuff. Yeah, well, the, the, the crazy part for me is this. I want your opinion. Sitchin lays out uh, a series of numbers, um, but, you know, between 200 and 400,000 years ago when all of this stuff is going down. And then an anthropologist uh, will tell you uh, in any history book that Homo sapiens sapien, the modern version of us, is 200,000 years old. And it matches up with uh, Sitchin's work as he was transcribing these texts. But yet an anthropologist won't in any way uh, say that there was something else that interfered with us, whether it's the count of chromosomes or DNA modifications or, or how we just appeared here on this planet. But yet Sitchin explains it pretty elegantly. And it just shows me that if, if it's Occam's razor, Right, the simplest. I think the way that Sitchin and and Lloyd Pye and others um, have laid it out makes a lot of sense, and I think that we should explore it. Yes, and let's remember too that Sitchin wasn't theorizing so much as transcribing what he found written. Right. I don't think he was editorializing very much. No, I don't think he was either. I, and what's I, really interesting. Uh, he was decried as a fraud originally by mainstream anthropologists and linguists who said, how could he possibly know what he's talking about? Nobody knows this language. How could he know? Okay. So they said, it's impossible. What he's done is impossible. So it can't be true. And then other scholars got on the case and they confirmed his translations. So one question is, how did Sitchin get his knowledge? Did he get divine inspiration? You know, was he channeling? a being that was giving him the clues and visiting him in his dreams or something like that. I, I, I don't, I don't know that he ever explained how he arrived at these translations. I don't know. I, I haven't read that at this point. Um, I, again, I'm no expert on him, but I've read enough to know that he's totally resonating where I'm with where I'm coming from, that humans are, would not be here as we are. Homo, Homo sapiens sapiens would not be Homo sapiens sapiens without the intervention of some ETs. And that we have ET genetics in us, that so-called mystery DNA, the, right? It doesn't occur in any other mammal on earth. 
Right. Hello. <laughs> it, wouldn't surprise, it wouldn't surprise me if he if he channeled some of this. No, it, it, it wouldn't. wouldn't it, it, it wouldn't. I mean, I I have been told that he he did uh, channel this. I I don't want to get in, into that, but yeah, um, it's it's a but, sidebar. But yeah. however he got his knowledge, he was decried as a fraud, and it turned out he wasn't. And there was no public apology from the mainstream, of course, right? But we know that his translations hold water, and this is and, and that humans were bioengineered by the Anunnaki to mine gold in the African heat because the Anunnaki were wimps and the slave race they brought with them, the Ijiji were also wimps and couldn't handle it. It was hot. <laughs> they were tired. Right, right, right. right. Um, I am, I'm very excited that uh, in November, um, uh, I'm finally going to make it down to Peru and I'm going to go and um, Machu Picchu, uh, but I'm also going, uh, I'm going to go see the skulls and I'm going to do all of that stuff. I'm going with a uh, Brian Forrester and I'm going to lead this tour, but nice. Um, but I got to tell you the Nazca lines. Okay. Uh, it, do you mind? Can we talk about the Nazca lines for a second? Oh, yeah. I talked okay. about that on uh, legit paranormal news a couple, three weeks ago, by the way, I'm, I'm a feature on that show Wednesday nights. It's seven o'clock central, so that's eight o'clock Eastern. Eight o'clock Eastern, and you all can work it out from there. Legit paranormal news, and I'm Jet Fuel Gene Broida bringing all the UFO news and other stuff they want to talk about. That's fun on a Wednesday. But <laughs> when I was a kid, you and I are the same age, so if we back up and uh, 19, I, I remember this like it was yesterday, 70, 71. When the movie came out, Chariots of the Gods, and I would wait for the TV commercial, right? I, because they would show, uh, this is before I had a chance to go to the, the theater to see it in person, but they would show the Nazca lines, right? With the right, flying right, because that was a big deal. It, was for... a, it still is, right? But, but, but to me personally, it was incredible. And the idea that th these ginormous uh, glyphs, you know, carved in the desert that can only be, be seen from above. When, when you're 10 years old, your mind is messed with. And it was like, man, that, that makes perfect sense to me. I'm finally going to be able to go and see them from the air. And we're discovering more and more uh, glyphs uh, down there all the time. There's There was a new find. I, I reported on this, what, as I say, two, three weeks ago. There's been a, a second discovery. They're using modern inf uh, modern technologies to uh, do aerial detection, basically, that, that, Sat that, from satellite imagery, I think. That, so they're yeah. finding faint traces, you know, lines that are much fainter, yes. but patterns. And so was it? 400 more 600 more 100 something more like that. they found something like, that. something like that yeah that cat that they found on the side of the mountain with the cat ears <laughs> it's like man that is the most amazing anyway and they're huge the scale of these drawings are huge these the technology is that rock has been scraped away somehow to the depth of about, about one inch and about 10 inches wide 10 inches wide, an inch or so deep, and that the surface rock is of a lighter color. And when you scratch it off, you get the contrast of a darker rock underneath to the surface soil. Okay, fine. But it, these things are huge, measured in fractions of miles, right? Hundreds of yards, hundreds of meters and yards. So, and Von Donegan made the point that if you actually kind of back off and look at the whole mountain this, the shape of the whole mountain it looks as if the top of a mountain has just been sheared off to create a, a, a surface for these lines the lines are on a flat surface that should be mountain top in other words you're familiar with that right yes i am i am that's, I that's am. just crazy the scale of that kind of a work it's just, that's almost incomprehensible <laughs> but so, there it is it exists you see what I'm saying? Oh. it exists and so for things that exist that are hard to explain that international governments just want to say well don't you know just 
throw a blanket over it. Let's not talk about it. Let's pretend it doesn't exist because we can't explain it. With governments, if they can't explain it or control it, it's dangerous. So getting, you know, looping back to the modern task forces to study UAPs, UFOs, uh, they, uh, <laughs> sorry, I've, I've just, I got so many thoughts pell-melling all at once, but uh, they are, oh my gosh, they're just, Oh, I had it, but I lost it. Help me. Help me, Jimmy. <laughs> well, I'll help you with this. Help me. There, there, I had it, but I lost it. There, Here, how have a drink. how a is it possible to a thousand years ago to create these glyphs without a view from the sky? Right. It, there, it, just somebody, it wouldn't make sense. Why it, would you do it? I just don't understand. I can't wait to I see. I mean, why them. would you in the first place if you, because you can't see them? Now, is it on for, the ground what, as, what a, as a picture, right? Just same with crop circles. A crop, and I, I report a lot on crop circles, one of my favorite topics. For one thing, it's non threatening to people. UFOs kind of intimidate people, but crop circles, for some reason, non threatening, <laughs> even though they're, they can be kind of creepy. Uh, but uh, again, viewable only from an altitude from the air. And they occur mostly in the rolling pasture lands of central, south central England. That's crop circle central. So they're, they have hills and mounds, but it's not famous for Alps. You know, that's elsewhere in Europe. But what, so what, what, why the, do these things exist there? Yeah. What's the purpose of the Nazca lines, though? Well, I would say a, a couple things occur to me. Some of the some of the patterns look like landing strips, parallel lines, converging lines, uh, lines at acute angles, intersecting lines. Some look like airfields. Others are are pictures of things, and they almost look like doodlings. Like if you were in a task force left on Earth to monitor the situation. If you were of a species that lived hundreds or thousands of years and you had a lot of time basically to pass on Earth, maybe you would just start doodling. Maybe Earth was kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch or, you know, a notepad, that an artist pad where they're just like, well, you know, they've got spaceship, they've got lasers. Let's just blast. You know, there's these cool animals over there Let's in Africa. Let's go, monkeys, let's go take pictures of them and and and. <laughs> Put them on this mountaintop. <laughs> Graf graffiti, you know, graffiti, well, okay. art, uh, uh, directional signals like we were here. You know, uh, Kilroy was here. Kilroy was here. Um, Cairns, C A I R N, little uh, piles of stones that mark the way to something else. You know, you, you are at Earth, turn right to get to Saturn. <laughs> Could be. Could Turn be. left to go to Alpha Centauri. Could be. It, it, it could um, also, um, uh, beings were visiting. What do you think? The Nazca there? people, well, uh, uh, this is one of my ideas. So the Nazca people are being visited. And they had a couple of opportunities to go up in the ships and then look down at their village. Ooh. And and they were able to direct and communicate with the land and, and have the artists create those. But then after the visits stopped, they continued. They continued to draw the Nazca lines to, to get their friends to come back. Right? And uh, we're here. And I think that's another part of it. And and for some reason, uh, the visits uh, in that area just stopped, and they they were they were sad, you know. And they were always looking to the sky, and they were trying to, you know, paint a happy place for them to come back. But and, did anybody even yeah. live there at that time? I, I'm not familiar with the history of the area. Well, I know well, the Nazca lines are dating back as i recall it's 500 bc to 500 a.d basically yeah, yeah roughly. about a thousand years about a thousand the, at least the first set that they found that is correct but then so you know, they're not all that old but what, what, what about, is are there villages up there in that about, territory are there or evidence there that there had been you know yes, human habitation 
yes, of course. Yeah. We have uh, Puma Punku and, and the okay. Sun Temple, which is right there, um, and Lake uh, Titicaca. And, okay. Yeah, and, and so there's been a constant... Uh, constant life there uh dating back to about uh three to four thousand bc that we uh uh again academia will state well what do the native people say about it don't they have stories about it yeah the gods built it that's what they said well there you go problem solved it was the gods we know they're et's well when the spanish showed up they were like so who built this i don't know (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that, that was literally the answer uh it was already here the gods built it um and so and, and puma punku the the interesting thing aside from the h blocks and and ancient aliens and 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 so forth um uh, you know I, I i thank sukalos for the work that he's done uh with us but that astronomically for it to point at something it would have to have been built 15,000 years ago to point at a specific uh, constellation in the sky. Because of the shift uh, yeah, of, because of the stars that, that is correct. from the perspective of Earth over yeah. time? So when I, I mentioned to, uh, and this points back to academia, Gene. So when I mentioned this uh, to Michio Kaku, and we were just talking privately, right? And I, I pointed out uh, to him, and he's got he's got a pretty open mind. But when I talked to him about Puma Punku and the possibility of it being fifteen thousand years old, he he goes, up, 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 up. <laughs> <laughs> "Let me stop you right there, right?" And I was like, "But, but, uh, 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 no." No, and he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ice age, no, nothing, no, no, stop. And it was, it was very interesting to me to have him instead of, uh, you know, just inquisitive or maybe a little bit of an open mind. I know, know right? They can't even allow for it. What's that about? Stop. <laughs> he was like, don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. I, and- I, I actually feel sorry for people who can't allow for. Even, I can't even imagine. Well, that's why Gobekli Tepe is such a big deal. It's threatening right? to a lot of people's it's, paradigms. It's completely threatening. And, you know, that's really the deck the CIA was was told to play back in the 50s. That was the deck they were handed to play was the fear deck, you know, that we don't understand it, therefore we fear it, instead of trying to understand it so that we don't fear it, which would have been an equally rational maybe more rational approach to the phenomenon. But if you want to keep control, if you realize if you're, let's just say you're high up in the military, high up enough to know secrets and perhaps also in aeros or high and or high up in aerospace, the companion industry to the military. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're realizing that we have what we now know as computers, fiber optics, Velcro, but all kinds of microwaves, microwave ovens, all kinds of technologies that could be profitable in the future of your country. And why not ride that profit if you could by controlling it? So don't give it out freely to the people. You know, Tesla, Nikola Tesla was all about free energy. Give the energy of the earth to the people, for the people, of the people, by the people. But that's not what's been happening in the history of UFOs on Earth. It's been the opposite. It's been major control freaks keeping down this truth embargo that Steve Bassett talks about, the truth embargo on UFOs. And it's finally being blown apart. Not not blown apart. Like I said, it's it's come apart with a whimper. You know, not, not where are the national headlines? Pentagon admits UFOs are real and we don't know what they are can't have that because no, if we you don't can't. understand it we have to fear it well is see th- this is or so where, they tell us this is where the government messed up all right now they've got they painted themselves in the corner and this isn't the proverbial corner they've painted themselves into the corner in that uh instead of uh doing the the tesla model which Tesla said, electricity is everywhere. Give it free, right? And 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 I can show you how to do it. 
Well, uh, if it comes out that the government has had knowledge of free, accessible energy for the planet that could solve every, could feed and heat and clothe and provide light for, to everybody on this planet, to schools, you know, heat and 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 light schools. And, and food distribution, you mean you've been sitting on this technology? Now, talk about burning this place down. Uh, th- there would be quite a few upset people, and that's they painted themselves in the corner. There's, there's no way to disclose that. Something else has to happen for them to get out of this, uh, yeah. to yeah. get a hall pass, because right now... Ooh, man, there will be some angry people on this planet. Well, I thought there'd be angry people when the Pentagon said those videos were real. We've declassified them, and those guys, those those military personnel were not crazy. They weren't battle fatigued. They actually saw what they saw, and we support them now. We're not going to fire them. We're not going to threaten their families and kill them all. We're going to say... Come forward, whistleblowers. And by the way, whistleblowers are not coming forward because apparently it's kind of lip service. This new government initiative to get whistleblowers to come forward is apparently not what it's purported to be. Oh, there's a shock, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, what, what's more interesting in a way are deathbed confessions because let's face it, you got nothing to lose on the deathbed. And there have been some very interesting confessions because it's been that long now. This cover-up has been going on 70 years. So if you were 10 10 years old, 20 years old, then you're 90 now. And it's about that time for you, yeah? So we're getting these deathbed confessions of... And and they're saying that I would have said something earlier, but they threatened me. They threatened my family. Mm -hmm. They threatened my pension. They threatened my this. They threatened that. Threatened, threatened, threatened. Well, we live in a society where government agencies summarily threaten people who want to deliver a narrative that is truthful but unpopular with the government. Well, where does that put us, actually, in terms of what kind of culture we are? Are we a democratic republic anymore? Well, when uh, when Gillibrand, that's such a great point, because in Gillibrand's amendment, where she it, whistleblower is not the right uh, she she didn't use those words but there that there wouldn't be any uh, downside to coming forward we're not going to touch your pension and we're All not, right no reprisals right and and so um, with that um, the the way that they disclosed those three videos they just said the videos are real uh, in other words it's not a, a I, I, it's not an unreal video. It's a real video, but we can't talk about what's in the video. And then Gillibrand uh, uh, puts that wording specifically in the amendment. It seems like we're going forward. And then Kirkpatrick uh, last month comes out in the arrow hearing and says, I ain't got no ET. There's no evidence of ET anywhere. Right, right. it's very strange. Uh, the, how uh, current narrative is that the craft exists. We don't know where they are. We don't know who created them. <clears throat> and we have no reason to think that any intelligent being is behind them. What? Which doesn't <laughs> seem to be great dot connecting where I come from. It, it, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and remember, <laughs> I'm a dot connector. So, yeah. Again... If you're ill-informed, if you don't think things through, that would probably seem very reasonable and sensible, and you would believe it. But to other people who are analytical or have done research, it just doesn't wash. I mean, it, do- it doesn't hold true. I mean, it, it just It's just another lie, right? It, well, it seems that there is some audible chatter, uh, some from the New York Times, uh, some from uh, Carson, uh, Andre Carson's hearing, um, and the Wilson Davis document. It seems like there's some chatter now about uh, crash retrievals and the mm. government being in possession of this. And you cannot be in the possession of of crash retrievals and say that there's nothing going on here. We don't know. Anything. Right. 
we're trying to, you, you can't have that both ways. I uh, agree. Do you think that that is what the whistleblowers are? That's the intention is to get somebody to come out of Lockheed and say, I've, I've been working on this SAP and yes, we do have, and this is where it is. Is that where things are going? And do you think that the Senate Congress house of representatives, that their interest is trying to get to the bottom of it? I think that contractors Government contractors have no self-interest or incentive to whistleblow. I think the whistleblowers are people I've talked about for a long time, experiencers who, who can't reveal what they've seen or experienced because they're fearful of losing their jobs, of being ridiculed and ostracated, ostracized in society because of the CIA long-term program to discredit just and debunk and that part of i i suspect the reason that the uh, certainly a driving reason behind the pentagon disclosure of 2020 was that they were in the awkward position of having very credible witnesses hundreds now thousands of credible witnesses in various military branches but especially the Navy on these carriers out at sea floating around seeing UFO phenomenon. I dated a guy who was in one of the, on one of these carriers and he said, we saw UFOs all the time, all the time, all the time. And if we talked about them, people just laughed at us. So we didn't talk about them, but we saw them all the time. They're a common phenomenon at sea, he said. And uh, I think the government decided that, it wasn't going to be tenable to continue threatening all these people. And also these people were experiencing profound psychological disorders because they had to keep a very profound secret, a very deep secret from everybody. And basically they have to deny it to themselves another- in order to believe that it's true. You have to convince yourself it's true to, to make a lie convincing. You have to believe it. It's and another- they're basically having to brainwash themselves. And I think that became the snapping point. And, yeah, they, and there were so many of these reports accumulating that the government realized we got to, we got, it's like a uh, pressure cooker that if we don't let the steam off, it's going to explode in our faces and a bad thing is going to happen. So let's give them an avenue to whistleblow safely. Most people don't care anyway about UFOs because for decades now we've been telling them you must be crazy to believe in them. So most people don't spend any time thinking about them at all or what it might mean if there were aliens among us, which there are. So, you know, you get a certain category of person, the military personnel, allowed to talk about it now without fear of reprisal, without fear of losing their jobs or anything like that. And yet they aren't. This is what I'm reading in the literature. They aren't coming forward and whistleblowing. So why would that be for well, their investigation to follow? Well, in your book, you've got the top 10 UFO cases, right, in Unknown Objects. And if the hearings and what the Senate there, it is right there. And uh, everybody it forwards or backwards. It's, it's, it's correct. <laughs> it's backwards to me. No, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can read the entire on, on whole, Amazon. Whole, Amazon. Yes. You can go to Amazon. And my excellent roommate did the art. I know I'm interrupting you. It's terrible. I'm a terrible ten, guest. Uh, it's terrible. Here's the nighttime retrieval. See the army truck. Yeah, there it is. That's but but go ahead, Jimmy. I'm sorry, Gene. <laughs> the, <laughs> kid. If they if they want to stay uh, so military centric in in who is coming forward and talking about this, we've got Rendlesham. Right? Oh, I love Rendlesham. It's, it's, oh yeah, I just talked about of, that on paranormal, legit paranormal news. Well, uh, uh, we everybody is alive, and it's a it's an Air Force case. And we have all the documentation. Why and there was a we... landmark settlement? You, you're familiar with the military, the VA settlement? Of course, of course. I've had uh, Colonel Halt was awarded no. millions of dollars for the cancer that he got as a direct result of contact with the UFO on the ground, and no, that's he... what his that's what the lawsuit said. John John Burroughs, you mean John Burroughs? Was it Burroughs? Yeah, it was Burroughs. But, but I apologize. I but, sit corrected Burroughs. Go ahead. Why, why doesn't uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee 
bring Burroughs forward, bring Halt forward, Jim right. Kingston forward. Why and- aren't they on these committees? I, I don't understand it. That's what I want to know. Why don't we have actual subject matter experts on these committees? Even even people from the History Channel, for Pete's sake. Yeah. yeah. Even David Duchovny. I- <laughs> but if, if 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 that's what they want to do, if they want to stay, uh, you know, in military circles, you've got a modern case. All the witnesses are alive and with us, and and you have all of the documentation and all of the reports, everything that was done by the United States Air Force. It's it's all right there, and you are able to question and get testimony from those that were there and yes. I, I, I don't and know they understand. don't and they're not why what up what up what well, up well and and i think that there's also a connection back to gillibrand because gillibrand uh again wrote uh into the budget in in and in, into law uh to protect those that would be affect their that their health would be affected and I think that she was referring uh, directly at John Burroughs and, and 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 everything that he went through after his contact in, in the Rendlesham Forest. So they obviously know that UAPs, UFOs, are affecting people directly, and they have evidence of this. You know, but they want to say that they don't understand the phenomena. It's 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 so perplexing. It is perplexing. It's spy versus spy versus spy versus spy. There's so many layers of deception. And, you know, the best lies are founded on some truth. The most convincing lies are founded on some truth. So there's probably some truth, some lie. (sighs) Yeah, I know. And, uh, you know, it's job security for us, Jimmy. One last, as paranormal researchers one last, we'll never run out of of stuff to talk about one last question <laughs> before i let you go um administrations come and go but the agencies and the military these are lifers these are careers that and and agendas that continue after each administration goes through um its cycle um, is is this stuff ever revealed uh, to an administration, or is a president just not important enough uh, to to be right in? Well, you probably heard that the prime minister slash president of Russia told the story of being of being approached when he became he alternates with the other guy to be president or prime minister of Russia. So he said in one of his terms, he was approached by uh, basically a secret agent with a briefcase handcuffed to his wrist. And he went into a private office, unhandcuffed the briefcase, opened it up and gave him a briefing on UFOs. And he said the same thing happens to presidents of the United States. Mm -hmm. And there was at least one president of the United States who alluded to that, that conversation or interview and was told Ixnay on, on the Aber, you know, don't blab about it. (laughs) Don't be talking about this to anybody. And there were other, and so I think certain presidents get the briefing and others don't in the United States. That seems to be what's going on. Some presidents apparently just don't get it, but it was, former Prime Minister of Defense of Canada, Paul Hillier, who really broke that aspect of the story, that when he took over his office, within two weeks, he had files crossing his desk on the UFO phenomenon. Whether he whether he received a private briefing or not, he started to receive incontrovertible evidence that these things exist. And so after his term, he began to whistleblow and talk about a credible witness, and yet there were still debunkers saying that Hellyer was making it up, that he was grandstanding. It was just, you know, what? <laughs> Why would he? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. So what's the next step, though? I, I don't think that the community should relax. Maybe Mars attacks? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what about Project uh, Blue? Uh, is it Bluebeam? 
What do you mean? The holograms in space? Werner it's, Braun Braun? Fake space attack? It's, yeah, it's Lions and lambs? Any, dogs any, and cats? Man, anything is possible. Well, we kind of <laughs> had that when we were firing missiles over the United States back in February. Uh, is it Revelation? Is Jehovah yeah. going to show up and fight? You know, th- now we get back to Sumerian myth. Is it going to be Enlil and the other one? Enlil and... Enki. Enki, yeah, the other end, the two end half-brothers. Are they going to show up with their spaceships and have another aerial battle like in that woodcut from the Middle Ages in Germany? I think it'll be Elvis Stay tuned. and Jimi Hendrix. It'll be Elvis and Jimi Hendrix. This That's is true. why the aliens come to Earth. It's just like a constant scene here. It's it's, uh, it's a show. It's a scene. It's a movie. They, they love uh, it here. Uh, thank you so much. And everybody, uh, you can get uh, Unknown Objects right there on Amazon. Yeah. The, One more time. Uh, no, we put up the link in the chat for you, Gene. So it's right there. Everybody go and get it. Gene, thank you so much. And I can't wait to have you back on the show. Uh, Jimmy, it's been a real pleasure. I can't believe the time went so fast. And I've glanced over, anytime I'm glancing over, I'm looking at the chat. There's been some very interesting chat here, too. Your audience is on the ball. I salute you all. Gene, you're the best. I remember uh, everybody when when I met Gene and uh, she gave me her book and and we talked uh, briefly. And I don't know why we waited so long uh, to get you on the show. It just doesn't make any sense. But we'll have you back on soon. Thank you so much, Gene. Be safe out there and keep doing your thing. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye, everybody. Great conversation, Gene Broida. And again, um, uh, Bill has got the link up for Unknown Objects. It's right there in the chat. We've got it over on our website and throughout social media. There you go. Great conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Gene. And uh, what am I doing tomorrow night? Tomorrow night on the show. Oh, tomorrow night, I got Drew Beeson on the show. We're going to be talking about D.B. Cooper, the Zodiac Killer. And uh, and some other stuff. It's going to be really great. All of that tomorrow night with uh, uh, Drew Beeson. All right. So that's tomorrow night. Thank you so much, everybody. Perfect show. Perfect conversation. And I want everybody to be safe out there. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network King. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Drew Beeson, I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy. Yeah.